um, I'm not sure who we've got watching, but um, <laughs> at this point, presently, this might be some kind of webinar record, but um, you're the only person. <laughs> um, I think that's just because this is the second time that I'm delivering this particular webinar on data entry and using the website. And the first time I did it, it was recorded and it's on our YouTube channel. So I guess the need to be here live probably has severely reduced since the last time I did it. Anyway, welcome to my one guest. Um, do tell me your name if you're willing and then we can, this can be your personal webinar. Um, so I can't see you or hear you because we've set it up as a webinar with the idea that we've had, we'd have multiple people attending more than a Zoom meeting. Um, therefore, please use the chat um, to sort of ask questions or just say hi. Um, otherwise, just to let you know, this is going to be recorded and put on the website as well, just because I'll probably have a little bit more of an update about using the app on this particular one, um, just because we've had a new update on it, but also um, I've I managed to sort of do a little video about how to use it. So this webinar is probably one of our drier subjects, probably hasn't helped the uh, number of attendees either. Um, because it is sort of about the bare bones of the project, which is the data. And essentially, that's what's so important about the scheme is getting this important data um, and in a place where people can use it and it can influence policy and all sorts of things. Right. So, so just give you a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to cover in this session. So we are looking at the website in general and how to navigate and create an account or edit an existing one. Um, we'll look at then creating plots, viewing plots and editing them and squares and then on to entering the actual data. So, um, as I've said, this is a little bit of a drier subject than one of our sort of species and habitat training ones and everything, but it can be a, a really useful thing to watch just to familiarise yourself with how to navigate around the website and how to put all of that vital data in. So the home page basically contains some background information about the scheme and how you can get involved. And also there are shortcuts to some things like our blog, the news pages and newsletters. Um, and then the menu button in the top right hand corner is how you navigate to all the main pages of the website. Um, and they've got little drop down options when you select the plus symbol. Um, so let's make a start. So resources is one of the ones that could be really, really useful. Um, so as I mentioned, you press the little plus symbol and then it brings down the drop down of the orange titles, which are underneath resources. So we've got things like how to get involved, but you probably already know that if you're an existing member. Um, the forum isn't really used so much, um, something that we might be removing at some point. Um, we've got our news, which is where we put any kind of news stories, and I think that's where we've got our latest about the app. Our blog, which hopefully we should be having another one soon, um, all about using plant ID apps. Um, and then we've got our conservation and research page, um, which has got all sort of the details of papers that have been produced from the data um, about the indicators and other things like that, the health of our habitats, and obviously a publicity page. So uh, the actual resources page is probably going to be the one that you use the most. So if we have a look at that. So as you can see here, um, there's a whole host of resources available that you can download um, on, and save on your own device. So there's obviously the survey guidance notes and obviously the forms which you can print off. Um, there's basically it's all of your survey pack, but in digital form. Um, and also there's other additional resources. So there's the FAQs, which can be really useful because a lot of people have already asked similar questions that you might be thinking. So do check that out before you send me an email because you might find that it's already answered there. Um, we've got an overview presentation. Uh, the plot grid reference crib is probably one of the most um, useful things on this page, um, which will help you locate those specific numbered um, plots on your grid reference on your map, one kilometer map. Um, you'll see that the, the one kilometre map has got all of these numbers all the way across it and you want to be able to find those specific numbers on the ground to see if that's a suitable place to have your plot um, and this grid reference crib sheet will actually help you find out what that sort of 10 figure grid reference should be for that number and then you can use um, a grid reference app on your phone to then sort of locate it on the ground. We've also got a link for some useful books and websites 
Um, we've got our access section for the landowner access permission letter that you can download, print off and pop into the post or into somebody's letterbox. Um, we've got uh, information about some of our volunteer opportunities so you can become a mentor. But we also have our current updated mentors contact directory list as well. So uh, have a look there, see if there's somebody in your local area that maybe that you could ask them for help with um, identification things or just general maybe, um, you know, uh, advice about the methodology and that sort of thing. There's also some really useful links for um, some of the habitats and species stuff here like fern crib, fern glossary. Um, we've obviously got our ID guide and recently we've got the fit count flower guide, um, which is for the sort of pollinator scheme, but it's an extra guide that could be useful. Um, and then other pages, uh, as I've mentioned, so we've got the news and the blog and the publicity and the conservation and research. So I've already gone into that. Uh, and then another really useful part of the menu is going to be um, the training and events section. So obviously you've already found um, where our training and events are because you've obviously booked onto this website. So under online training is where we have all of our sort of standalone um, presentations. We've got our videos of these webinars on the website as well. So you can watch all of those and it's sort of a way of doing training in your own time really. We also then have training events at the bottom, which lists um, all of our sort of volunteer virtual get togethers and also now all of our actual face to face events that um, we are adding to as we speak. So we've got one in Scotland um, next week and we've got some more coming up in Scotland and we've got a couple in Yorkshire and I'm I've got one in Warwickshire. Uh, we're about to cover Wiltshire, West Sussex, um, and hopefully soon um, some in Wales as well. So um, not as many as we would normally have um, because of COVID, but at least we've got a few few actual meetups in the field. And in order to actually book on to one of those events, you need to go to the My Events section, which is in the middle there. And that gives you a drop down menu for the event you're interested in booking on to. And you can simply select that and it will book you onto the event and you should get an email saying that you're booked on. So, um, right, if we want to go and look at creating plots and entering the data, as you obviously can tell, that's the name um, that you want to choose. Um, and this is where you can view your square um, that you've been allocated and you've guessed it, create plots and then enter your survey data. Um, so we're going to sort of go into these processes in greater depth, but I'm just at the moment covering all of the aspects of the website menu first. So if you're currently sort of, if you recently just registered with the scheme, but have yet to adopt um, a square, then you want to go to the sort of request a square section so that you can um, have a look at, at where the squares near you and where you can sort of say, sign one up to yourself. So then when you click on that, you'll enter this page here, which has sort of two options that you can choose from really, where you can enter the number of miles from the postcode that you provided at your registration. Um, and then you're just able to press return and it'll give you those squares or you can return all MPMS squares on the map. Another option here um, is, well, when you return all squares, essentially, which means the whole of the ones to the UK, you can zoom in and out using the um, plus and minus here. And maybe there's somewhere in that you don't live, but somewhere that you visit regularly, either a holiday destination or it's maybe where you've got relatives and you think, oh, I'd really like to do a square actually over that way because that'd be a really interesting square. Um, then you can simply navigate and see where there is a square near there using the return all squares, zoom in and out and see if there's a square that you want to select there. So instructions for sort of navigating your way around the map using the icons are really useful. So um, basically, you can move around the map to sort of find your area. You can zoom in and out and you can click on the map to find relevant local information and you can also select a square to request. So it tells you here that the little crosshairs one is the navigation cross sort of moving it around a bit like a sort of hand grabber that you would use on Google Maps. Um, and then you've got this little select box, um, which means it will sort of show you information of where there are national parks and nature reserves. And then this little one, which is sort of a speech bubble with a question mark in it, is um, how you'd find out if that square is um, available to be sort of allocated to yourself. Um, and then you can switch on the plus sign at the side of the map, 
which will show you the layers of things like areas of outstanding natural beauty, triple SIs, etc. So that's quite useful. So yeah, as you can see, so here's the plus and minuses. You can also use these arrows to move around, or you can use the little crosshairs up here. Um, and then you can use that one to select a square, the speech bubble, and the other one for the information. And then the little plus with all the layers is just there. So this is where you've used the information pop-up, and it tells you that where you've clicked over here, where the little red box is, that that is part of an area of outstanding natural beauty, Cranbourne Chase and West, West Wiltshire Downs. I was actually there the other day, and oh, it's beautiful. Um, so that just gives you that little bit of information, which is useful. And this one says, uh, you've clicked over here, and it's on a square, and it says, would you like to assign this square to yourself? And you can obviously cancel or, or say OK. So then um, the next little box on the menu is called My Data. So you can either visit the My Visits to view all the surveys that you've already created, if you have, or you can opt to actually download all of your data in a number of different formats. I mean, the most popular is probably the CSV, which is sort of like an Excel spreadsheet, which basically looks the same. Um, and yeah, so that can be really useful. If, if you've only just started with the scheme, then know that maybe in a couple of years time, you could, or even every year, print off all of your data and you know share it with your friends and say, look what data I'm gathering. So that's really useful for yourself to sort of view. Um, it's particularly, we find a lot of um, people that are part of uh, monitoring groups or sort of local wildlife groups, that sort of thing, then they might have one representative that sort of has their account on here and they all survey the square together. Um, and then one person's responsible um, for coming on and entering the data on the computer, but they can then download that data for, for them. And that's quite useful to share around. So that's why people want it. The My Visits page, as I was saying, so that um, shows on the map the little blue dots are where you've actually recorded data. Obviously, it would be fairly unusual for you to have um, sort of five <laughs> dots because a lot of people don't take on five squares. And also, they're spread quite around the country here. But you'd probably just have the one blue spot if you've got one square, but it would show you where it is in the country. And then below that, it would list all of the surveys that you've done, um, survey one or two, and what level, and which square, and which plots, all listed beneath, which is really useful. So the data download, as I was saying, it basically means that you can download all of your data. Um, so you, you want to click on that and it will take you to here and then you want to um, select which survey type it is. Um, sorry, I just noticed a cat in my garden that's probably going to eat all my wildlife. Um, so you can select whether you want to look at the indicator survey, inventory or wildflower. And you can then select the date field, so whether that was from sort of this year, last year, and, and then also the format as well. And that you can then view all of the data. This uh, section in the website just talks about your account. So um, as you can see, you've got my account or my squares as the two options here. Um, so my account is where you can go in and view all of your account details. So if you've moved house and you need to change your address, um, a lot of people do ask me to do that, but you can go in and do it yourself, no problem at all. Um, so I think we're just going to cover a little bit about that next. So you go to my account and it will list the um, your details like this, um, where it will say how long you've been a member for, your full address. Um, and it's also really important to know here at the very bottom, it says request survey form. And obviously it's got yes here. Now, if you realise that you want to use the app, because it's so much more convenient, or you're just happy to print off the survey forms and use those, then you might want to come in here and go to edit and change that to no. Otherwise, um, you'll be sent them anyway, and then you'll be sort of duplicating efforts, essentially. Under my squares, which was also, you know, next to my account, um, this is where you can view the squares that you've um, got allocated to yourself. Um, and also you could look at, um, you know, finding a square that you already know the name of you could go in and request it here using this sort of select here and select the square as you can see these squares say approved um which is basically means that i've already sort of um you know agreed that this can be approved by that for that person um if you've only just recently asked for your square to be requested um and it'll say sort of waiting approval there instead and i do that once a week i go in and approve all the squares Equally, if you've decided you don't want to do that square anymore, you're moving or you just, you know, you 
decided to take on a different square, this is where you can come in and remove the square that's assigned to yourself. Um, you can simply click remove. I can also do it for you, but like, so you've got that um, autonomy over the, your account there. Um, and then obviously going back to the create plots and enter data. So we'll look at the first thing here, which is the view square and create plots, is what, which is what you're going to want to do first before you can start entering any of your data. Um, so let's have a look at that. So once you've clicked on that, this is what it will look like if you've not set up any plots already or there are no plots set up for that square already. It will simply say the square name under location and it will say add plot and view or edit square information, but it hasn't got any plot details yet. Um, so that's what it would look like. So this is what it would look like if you've gone in to look at your square and it already has plots created. Um, it'll have the plots listed underneath with the sort of specific grid references and then what type of plot they are. Um, and obviously then you can go in and view them um, individually. The reason it says my plot question mark, um, so if it says yes, that means it's a plot that you set up on this square. If it says no, then that means that you've taken over somebody else's square and they'd already set up plots. Um, so it's just simply saying you're not the one who created those plots, but you can still survey at them. And in fact, that is kind of what we try and recommend because then you'll be um, surveying at the same points. And obviously the continuity of that data is really important. So if you have recently been allocated your square, then you, you do want to come and check this page early on before you explore your square and decide on your plots. Because as I said, it might be that there's already plots set up and you don't want to kind of double up on efforts. So it might be worth going and seeing, especially if somebody's already gone to the effort of getting a landowner permission. Um, they've already put in sketches and maps and things like that. So um, you can go in and view the details about that plot and information on it. But as I said, if it's one that you haven't set up, then it will say no down here. So to view um, or edit the square information, so that's not the plot information, that's the one that's on the top, but that says the view um, square information this is what the page will look like um, so here you can download your square details again so that's like the one that is you've been sent in your pack or emailed to you or both I'm trying to do um, but if for some reason you don't have a copy of it anymore or you need to see it again you can simply click on the PDF here this is where we are hopefully ask people to put in the access and landowner information so for example you could put in that um, you know the landowner details or the address or the farm that owns it um, or you could put specific information like I don't know don't come on a Tuesday because this is when they're doing the sheep shearing or something um, you know that sort of information is so vital for somebody else taking on the square but also it'll remind yourself um, yeah and that and then you've got the map at the bottom here which shows you the exact outline of your square which is really useful to see it on sort of satellite mapping um, and you can zoom in and out um, with the um, plus and minus arrows. Um, you can also, again, use the little plus sign on the right hand side here to look at, set up all those layers again about where triple SIs are and things like that. So that can be really useful to look at when you're thinking about landowner permissions. So once you've been to the field and you've collected the information regarding where you want to set up your plots, so may, maybe that's on your sort of first little recce of the square um, using where the existing plot numbers are and you think, right, I'm pretty sure I know where I want to set up my plots. So you're ready to sort of submit these details on the website at this point. So you need to add plot for every survey plot you have within your one kilometre square that you want to create. So that's a maximum of five plots roughly. Um, but you only need to do this once and then you've done it for the rest of the time that you're going to be surveying your square. So it can seem a little bit of a task at first, but next year you won't have to do it because you will already set it up. So essentially you want to um, add plot for this square. So then you're presented when you select add plot, you're presented with the draw plot page. Um, now, essentially you've got the plot type that it's asking you to select here. So we've got square for normal habitats, which is the five by five meters. We've got square for woodland, which is 10 by 10 meters. And we've got a linear plot here, one by 25 meters. So you select that from the drop down menu. There's a little box here that you can tick for expert mode. I'll go into detail about what that means, but it only adds a tiny extra little bit of functionality, not a huge amount. 
Um, so, and don't think that you have to be some kind of expert to use that function either. And then we've got the plot label. So often people want to call it the plot number that's the same on their um, one kilometre square, or they could call it plot A or whatever you want, as long as you know it's something that's going to make sense to you for your square. And that it's unique, obviously, because if you named all of them plot A, you're going to get very confused. Um, so then it wants to know the environmental data about the plot. So um, how sloping is the plot um, and which direction does it face, that sort of thing, which, you know, for most flat ones, you're going to put it's flat and you know, direction that it faces isn't really relevant if it's flat. It's mainly if that's sloped, you want to put that in. Um, and then regarding the grid reference here, um, it'll actually um, auto-populate this for you as you zoom in. So um, you want to use the zoom bar to the left um, of the map and the crosshead arrows buttons to sort of navigate away around the map. And once you've found your plot location on the map by zooming really far in, you can then use the little icon here and that will click the center of your chosen plot with that and that generates the, the grid reference here. So essentially you use that to zoom in, oh, sorry, you zoom in and you use that to select where you want, you want your plot. I'll go into more detail in a minute. So let's through an example once on the draw plot page. So we select the plot type, we selected five by five meters here. We are gonna enter the plot label, i.e. plot one, and then we enter the grid reference for the southwest corner of the square plot, which if you remember, that's what we gathered when we were in the field deciding where we were going to set up our plot. Um, we put the, the southwest grid reference point there. Again, using a grid reference finder on your app, just standing still and making a note of what's there on the, on the phone. So then you enter the environmental information that you collected in the field about the plot. And then you want to sort of amend the map coordinate system if necessary, but most people are going to be using British National Grid. Um, but obviously, if you've got the Irish Grid, then you want to put that in. Um, but that, the British National Grid is the default. So then we're going to use the zoom bar um, uh, to zoom in and out of the map. As you can see, we've zoomed much further in. And you can use the crosshairs here to sort of drag the map around to find the exact location. So then we want to um, use the other little selecting box here, which is like a sort of rectangle with an arrow in it, um, to click on. So that's where we, we want our plot to be. Um, and then that will auto populate the grid reference here. So as long as you're clicking on the right, right place. Um, so then if we look at it for a linear example, um, the main difference is that you are asked to enter a plot end grid references rather than the southwest corner so sort of for the plot end um, grid reference here um, and, and you'll be collecting those in the field as well so again same sort of things you just want to mark it where it is um, and then click on it and it will auto populate here so then your plot details that they want you to put in afterwards so you want to upload a field sketch of your plot to help your plot location. So it's completely up to you how you do this, but I imagine the, the easiest way is going to be to draw it on a piece of paper and simply just take a photo of it with your phone, your smartphone. Um, you, if you've got a scanner, you could scan it in, that sort of thing. But you want it to be as detailed as possible. Um, so even if you think that you're sort of going over the top with um, describing this little sunken bit here and this little patch of rush here you know it can be really useful for later on and then include a written description of the plot and the features that are there and that could be you know as simple as uh, there's a rose bush in the corner here and uh, the path um, is sort of two meters from the eastern edge of the plot or something um, and just try and make it as easy to sort of find it as possible and then you want to make sure you click submit at the end so I'll just show you what it's like to use in expert mode. Um, so again, you're selecting the plot type, but this time you're going to click expert mode. Uh, you still enter the plot label and the southwest grid reference corner um, there, just like you did before. But the two extra functions that you have on the map are that you can basically, um, you'll see two additional circles. So you can see the circle on the corner and a circle in the middle there. and Basically, the square marker will be slightly more to scale 
and the circle in the center of the square allows you to click and drag the marker to amend the location and the second circle the one on the corner will allow you to turn the angle as you can see so if for example you know that you've you've had it um, lined up with this corner edge over here or something then you can turn it to that direction um, and then the same applies so in um, linear plot um, creation with expert mode once you're actually here doing it on the map you've got this extra little functional button here which is sort of um, the, the line drawing function um, little icon here and then you'll want to select that so that will basically allow you to draw the line of the plot, um, which would, you know, is really useful for people coming to sort of redo your plot and it's useful for yourself. So it'll be there as a linear plot. And that's all the expert mode does. Oh, and it's worth just pointing out that once you've kind of clicked along, you need to double click and then it will sort of finish a bit like when you're drawing shapes in um, any of the sort of Microsoft Office um, sort of uh, suites of, of different programs you double click and then it'll finish the the line for you so once you've completed your surveys it's obviously time to enter your data because that's why you're doing it so within the site menu for on the website you want to go back to the create plots and enter data but then instead of obviously view squares and create plots you want to choose the survey form that you recorded at so um, there's a separate entry pot sort of pathway for the different levels so choose one of those that you're recording at so if we look at wildflower first so you're taken to the wildflower level data entry page containing the instructions as to how to add so it does tell you a little bit of brief something about how to do it and it will also have any data that you've already entered at this level previously um, as a list underneath so if you've not already previously entered data, then it'll say like this, no event, no information available because you obviously haven't put any in yet. So here's an example where some you've already ex um, entered data at this level um, by yourself. Um, and it's, you know, whether you've submitted data previously that year or historically or not, in order to enter data for every new plot, you need to click um, add new sample at the bottom. Uh, and this will take you to a new recording form to start entering your survey data. So you want to do this every time you need to enter data for a survey um, for, plot for surveys one and two. So obviously we've got all of the details of previous surveys here, but if you're putting in data for a new survey, then you may want to make sure you're adding a new sample at the bottom. This will then take you to this page, which you want to make sure that you select the square. Now, obviously most people only have one square, but it all sort of still won't have that as a, it'll just have it as a drop down that you still have to select um, and then on the drop down here you want to select the plot that you're recording at for this particular one so plot three for example here and it will then automatically fill the spatial reference because you've selected plot three already and you just want to make sure that you click next step also it will show you the plot on the, the screen here so if you suddenly think oh that doesn't look right and then you look back and you're like oh whoops i've selected the wrong plot number that's why um, and then click next, le next step. So then this following page replicates the survey forms that you use in the field essentially. And you want to um, first of all enter the date of the survey. And when you click on that, it will give you um, a calendar view and you just select the date um, as you would on any other form. Um, and then it wants you to enter the broad habitat type first. And then it will bring up another box alongside it, which will have the fine habitat. If you're only recording at the broad habitat type, that's fine. Just simply choose that one and you don't need to choose the fine habitat, but it, it's got the little red star here, meaning you have to select the broad habitat type, definitely. And we always try and encourage people to select the fine habitat type. And then here uh, you can select any of the management options that apply. And obviously if it's something completely different to the ones listed here, you can tick other and then describe the management that you're talking about in there. Um, so those are all sort of similar to the forms. And then here you have the grazing information. So obviously if there isn't any, then leave it blank. But otherwise you just use the drop down for which grazing pressure, write down which animals if you know. Um, and then the next thing just wants to know how wooded is your plot. The same on the form. So you're just entering that with a drop down option. And then you enter the information for the vegetation height, just like you did on your form. Um, so again, you're using the sort of values of 0 to 3. 
um, and make sure that it says your name and not Joe Bloggs on these uh, recorder names. You want to take credit for this. This was you that did it. And then it's got the options here for bare soil, rock, gravel, litter, mosses and lichens. And as it says, just leave it blank if you, you found that there was zero, you know, if, if you're looking at grassland and there is no bare soil, then you'll be leaving it blank. But it's all there for you to enter. Uh, then it has an option for adding your plot photo, so the one that you've taken in the southwest corner of your plot. So simply once you click on add photo, it will come up with like your file explorer, sort of where you can choose where your photo is saved on the system. Uh, and you can write any additional comments in here as well, um, which whatever you think might be useful. Um, you know, maybe you've come to your grassland and it's suddenly been cut way earlier than it would be normally. And so it's really difficult to identify anything. So you can write the notes about that there. And that's all useful for the data analysis afterwards. And then you simply click next step. So on the next page, you'll find um, a list of indicator species. Now you have to work down this list, um, adding the abundance score based on the Domin scale, as you've written down on your survey form and as recorded in the field for those species that were present um, on your survey and leave blank for any species not observed or recorded. And there's the option also to add images alongside each species, which are really useful. And then you simply click submit. So it's worth pointing out that for the record, the wildflower recording form, it basically has all the species that are listed within the scheme here for you to sort through. And one thing that is a bit frustrating, and it's something that I'm feeding back to everyone, is that the list is in alphabetical order according to the Latin name, which if you're anything like me, sometimes you sit there scratching your head and like, oh, I can't remember the Latin name, but I know the common name. And obviously you have to go down in the order that it's listed. But if you make sure that you've got your MPMS guidebook with you as you're sitting at the computer, um, it doesn't matter if you've written it all on your survey form with common name, because that's certainly how I do it most of the time. You can then simply flick through your guidebook and look up the common name and it'll give you the Latin next to it. And then you can look it up here quite easily. And then you simply put in the domain value. So um, again, as you've already done on your form, you just make sure you click submit at the end. If we go in and have a look at the indicator recording form instead, it's pretty much the same, but a little bit different um, at the plant species part. So again, if you've not recorded any data previously, then you wouldn't see any of this. If you have, it would be there. But either way, you're putting in new data, so you want to add new sample. Uh, so again, you select the square, you select the plot, and that will autofill the grid reference, and it will zoom in there, and you click next step, so no different. And you want to put in the date and the habitat type just as before, and the management just as before. And all of these options, as I've already explained, are no different at all on this form. Plot photo, comments, next step. But then when you come to the species records, it, it just looks slightly different. So it'll have basically nothing listed below here. It'll just have a blank box that you can start writing in. And as you start typing, it will then suggest the options below. So for example, here you can see you're starting to write ran. And so it assumes that you're meaning ranunculus, which is the buttercup family. So it then lists some of the ranunculus species below. And you can simply choose whether it was a acris or bulbosus or repens. Um, and then you can select from the drop down for the domain scale. And you don't want to click submit after each species. You want to make sure you've done all your species first and then click submit. So it, although it looks like that, you might do it after each one. You don't want to. Otherwise, you'll only have recorded one and you have to go back in and edit it, which will be a bit of a pain. Um, it's also worth noting that you can put the common in here and it will also bring up the names underneath. So you can see you can put in the scientific or the common common name. So then the final option is the inventory recording form. So remember, if you're wanting to record it on the indicator level that we were just doing, you have to go in via that form and the wildflower via that form, etc, etc. And again, you want to make sure you click add new sample. Uh, same with square plot. All of that is exactly the same. Um, all of this, I was just showing you here, the different options for the drop down of the habitat type and then how the little box appears for the sort of subgroup, you know, the fine habitat. So we've got lowland grassland here and it's giving you the four choices of which fine habitat it is. Um, that's the same across all of the recording levels. 
And then just as the indicator form, it gives you the option to put in and start typing, and it's exactly the same. The only difference here is that you'll be putting in every single plant that was present in your plot. And so it will be a bit of a longer list and probably take a little bit longer. Um, so basically, each survey you enter is then stored on the database and you can filter by square or by year and it will show you all that data for that you've created, which is really useful. We also have the option for extra species entry. Um, so this might be that you know, you're recording at wildflower level, but you know that you've also got this species, that species, and that species, but you're not confident enough to go in at indicator or even inventory level, but you know you've got these extra species, so you want to enter them. So you can't put them in with your main data entry and give a domin scale, because that's not what we're asking for, but you can put in that data because it's still useful data, and that's where you do it in the extra species entry data. So basically that just asks for the, you can see you've got the squares here with the plots underneath, so you just want to select which one it was. And, oh, it did, oh yes, the other option is um, you select one of those locations or you can click on the map actually if it wasn't actually in one of your plots. So, for example, say you were walking up to your plot location and you found a lovely patch of orchids and you thought, do you know what, I wonder if anyone's ever recorded that. Um, I think I'm going to record it because that's useful information. Um, then you can go in and do it this way. So you simply use the main map to navigate exactly where it is. Focus right in. Oh, I remember it was on the corner of the fence and there you go. And then you can click on there and it will auto populate the spatial reference. So you can enter species data that's not in your plot here as well. Um, and that simply have the date um, and any kind of comment um, that you want to make about it. And then simply start typing um, the extra species um, and, you know, you, you can add a photo as well if you want it to be verified, which can be quite useful if it's a rare plant. Um, but we, as you can see, there's no option to enter the abundance of it. So, um, yeah, but it's just presence or absence really for this one. So then you can view all of your submitted surveys in one list, irrespective of survey level, by going to the My Visits page rather than going in uh, on, in the individual survey form. So it might be that maybe you start off at wildflower level and you do a couple of years surveying at wildflower level, but then you build up your confidence and you think, actually, this year I'm going to do it at indicator level. Um, and you start recording at that level. Um, you can go under my visits and it will have all of your um, surveys that you've done and it will tell you which level you're at. Whereas to view the individual information, you'd have to, um, for each survey level, you go in on the survey recording pages. So we also do have an app that can be used directly in the field. Um, basically, it's instead of this point where you're sitting down at the computer and you're entering your data, you can actually do it live while you're in the field. Um, the only thing is, is that you have to have created your, red, um, your account on the website first, and you would have had to have created your plots on the website first. We, there's no way of creating plots on the app at the moment. And that may change, but it, it certainly isn't the case at the moment. Um, it's available on Android and Apple, um, and it's asking you exactly the same information as the recording form, and it's quite easy to use. So what I'm going to try and do um, in a second, so I'm gonna in a minute I'm going to show you a little bit more about the app in particular. But before we do that, I just want to say so really important um, that you're getting that data and you're getting it on the website um, because obviously that that data goes straight into um, the website, which is where it stores all the data, um, and then that data is then used for scientific research, and um, we've got one of our scientists here, Ollie, doing a great job. Um, we've got a new data analyst um, just started this week for us. It's going to be analysing it all and looking at climate change, and it's a really interesting chap. He's a paleoecologist. Um, so we're going to find out some fascinating information, if perhaps sometimes a little depressing, um, but hopefully the point is that the more we know, the more we can do. So that's the that's the plan. The idea is that we try and get you all to enter your data by Halloween, the 31st of October. Um, but that doesn't mean if it goes past that point that your data is useless. We, you can still enter it all afterwards as well. Um, but it just means that if you wanted your data to be included in that spring analysis for the, the following year, um, looking back at the year, then you need to have done it by that point. But, you, you know, if you've got old data from when you started and you just haven't 
sent it in or haven't put it up, you can put all of that in. You just simply have to choose the correct dates. That's no problem at all. So as I've said, in terms of um, finding support with your data entry, you know, obviously you can rewatch this because it's going to be going on the website. Um, so you can stop it at the point where you got confused. Or we've got the other version that I did before as well. Um, maybe I've missed out some bits. I don't think I have, but just in case. Um, we've also got um, the YouTube channel also has sort of a whole holding you through going through it on the website and sort of how to do it it's a little bit dry because all you're looking at is the website and somebody doing it but that can be quite useful to follow along you've also got the option to email me if you need to and you can even arrange a one-to-one -one zoom call with me and we can go through your specific square plots and data and everything like that um so there's lots and lots of ways that you can get help now what i'm going to attempt to do now is try and show you the little video I did about using the app. So for anyone who's already seen it on the YouTube channel, you can you can depart. Um, but uh, and, and in fact, before before I show it, it might be worth saying: Has anyone got any questions first before I play the video? Um, that you know, if you've seen the video and you want to depart, that's absolutely fine. So if anyone's got any questions yet, not yet. Um, while you're thinking, I will um, get it ready uh, to share the right screen. So that should be fine. Screen one and optimize. Right. So hopefully. You can all see the video okay. Uh, I've got volume up there. Um, sometimes when you're sharing a video across Zoom, it can come across quite quietly on the other end, no matter how many times I change the settings. So um, you might want to turn your your sort of all your volume controls up as far as they'll go, um, because I'm fairly sure all of my settings are as high as they can go. So yeah, I'll play this little video about how to use the app. In this video, I'm going to show you how the MPMS app can be used and how I use it in the field. It is important to note that in order to use the app, you need to have registered on the MPMS website first. You will also need to have your square allocated to yourself and have entered or created your survey plots on the website. This app is for entering your plant or habitat data while still in the field saving you time and energy stuck in front of a computer when you could be outside enjoying the countryside. Here is how the app looks on your phone. Remember to log in. Right, let's look at some of the features. Under info I can select the training mode which is one of our new features. Under the about section I can read about the scheme. Here I can also find links. The first one is a link to the website page about how to get started. So we can just read it down there and there's the link. And it takes us directly to the website and it'll tell us all about how to get involved. The one called Brief Overview takes you to a PDF flow diagram which can be useful to look at or show somebody about the scheme. There is even a link for the support email address to get in touch directly with me. Right, let's go back. Under resources, there are links to other useful apps, plant ID apps like Flora Incognita. This will take you to the app store to download it if you don't have it already. There are also grid reference apps to help you locate your plots. Again, this will take you to the app store. Another really useful app link is iRecord. This useful link is here if you want to record species from other taxa groups like butterflies, fungus or bryophytes. In the help section you will find instructions on using the app and keys to the symbols and buttons. You can read this if you feel like you're having any troubles in using the app. To enter your data in the field you will want to click on the back arrow here. Then select plus or add survey and choose which level you are recording at. Then choose the habitat, for example, broadleaf woodland. Then the fine habitat, for example, dry deciduous woodland. 
Next, you'll want to start entering species. Click on Add Species. When you begin typing the species name, it should appear as an option below. You can also add a photo, either by taking it or choosing one from your gallery. You can type the common or the Latin name, and don't forget to select the Domin value. If a species isn't appearing, it might be because the name you are using isn't recognised. Now you have your list of species. You'll want to make sure you've entered your plot name or number in the location. You can view your PDF of your monad here too. Next, enter the date. Now you need to start entering the additional information. First you have the management options. Select all of these that apply or write in the additional information. Then you need to add in the grazing level if relevant. Then how wooded is the plot? Next, vegetation height. All these options replicate the paper and website based survey forms. So you should simply be repeating what you have done before. Now for bare soil. Bare rock or gravel. Litter, not crisp packets of course, but leaf litter. And finally, mosses and lichens. Now you are ready to send off your data. I'm still on training mode, so don't forget to turn that off before you send it. Once it says sent, you will see a little paper aeroplane symbol next to it, showing that you have sent the data off. At this point, you can share your survey on social media if you wish by clicking on share. You can then choose the social media platform for example Twitter, which automatically allocates a hashtag and pre-populates the tweet for you, ready to send off, and then you can share it with everyone. I'm now going to show you how I actually use the app in the field. For this one I've chosen Dry Deciduous Woodland from the Broad Scale Broadleaved Woodland. And I'm going to start by doing it at wildflower level first of all. So I've selected wildflower level after I've selected everything else and I'm going to go into broadleaf woodland, hedges and scrub. And then I'm going to select my fine habitat as dry deciduous woodland. I then would put my location in and the date's already populated and so is my name so I don't have to put those in. And now I go in for species. So I've got my app open and it's ready for me to put in the species. So for example, I'm now going to, I'll have my list with me and I can see what the wildflower species are for this habitat type that I need to recognise. So I know in front of me, I've got a hazel stand here and hazel is included. So I've got hazel here. So I'm going to select hazel. One of the next things it gets me to do is to select how many are in my plot. So I'm going to have a look around imagining that I've obviously got my boundaries all marked out nicely. So I've got this one here, I've got this one that's just inside the plot here, and I've got another one there and there, and another one over there. Oh, so let's think. I think we're probably looking in my plot, I mean always an estimation, but we've got more than one to two individuals probably slightly more than several individuals. So I'm going to probably say we've got about 5 to 10% hazel for this one. And now we have the option to put in another species. So what else have we got here? Now I can see we've got a species of violet down here. Now at this point I would then walk around the whole of my plot and try and work out how much violet I've got. I've already had a quick look round and to be honest it gets a lot thicker over there and little plants like violets can't really cope with so much over there so I think we're mostly only along this edge line. So we're going to have just a quick look around. Got some more violet down here. Quite a bit over here in fact. Just dotted about. So I'm probably going to say that it's almost a similar amount of hazel really. So I'm going to start putting in the Latin for this one. Viola, and it's a combination of Reichenbachia and Riviana. 
between early and common dog. So I might say about the same, 5 to 10%. Here in my plot, I can see I have got some sweet woodruff here. You can see the yellow, the little white flowers here. And when I look around, there's, there's a good amount of it just in this corner. So first thing I'm going to do is look up sweet woodruff. And as I type, there it is, and I can select on it. And now I just need to try and work out how much I think. And I'm probably going to go with slightly less than the rest of it, so 1% to 4% there. And there you go. You can see it's already started to make a note of the species that I've got. Right, so now that I've got my species, I'm now going to want to do some of the additional information here. So the first thing it wants to know is about management. Probably going to leave management blank because I wouldn't say this particular plot is actually managed. Grazing, again, there isn't any, so I don't need to put it. Woody cover. So let's have a look. There's woodland canopy here, so I'm going to select that one. Vegetation height. So remember, we're not including the woodland in this. So less than or equal to 10 centimetres. This is where it might be helpful to get down to the level here where we think we're looking for that sort of thing. One of the other things it wants to know is um, about whether there's any bare soil, bare rock, litter, mosses or lichens. So I know that we've got quite a lot of litter here. I mean, it's not only litter, but I would say it's a good percentage. I'm probably going to say this one. And mosses and lichens. Well, as you can see, we have got some mosses here. Can't see much evidence of many lichens here. I mean, there is some on the trees, but not a huge amount. So, probably if we go in here, I might say 1% to 4% for that one. Possibly not. You can go in and change it if you need to. Bare soil, again, not really very much bare soil at all, I'd say. 1% to 4%, there's some patches where the, the leaf litter is slightly cleared. And that's all our additional information. And now I want to take my plot photo. So, thing. so I'm standing in, my, in the southwest corner here, and I'm going to want to get access to the camera, so I'm saying allow. And I'm just going to take the picture from the same point. I might do it in landscape, actually. Make sure I'm the right angle. And there we go. I've got my plot photo as well. The other thing you'll notice on here is with the species, I can go back in. And if I wanted to take a picture of the woodruff here, I've got that option as well. So I can simply choose the camera, get back in here. This is very useful for anybody verifying it. And there we go. I can take my picture. Now you're ready to send off your data. Don't forget to turn it off training mode and then submit. So you can download the app from both the Apple Store and the Android Store. Enjoy!